Hi, everybody. I love this little service. It just makes me feel good. I love the meditation. I don't ever want to come out of it. Um, so I, it looks OK. So I even wore my compassion bracelet this today, my little yoga shirt. Um, thank you, Terry, for asking me to speak today. Um, it's so funny. I was talking to someone at church this morning, and I said, well, I'm going to speak over a fellowship tonight on compassion. And they're like, compassion? That's a hard topic. And when you, I heard, you know, I read your voicemail first and you said compassion. I thought, oh, wow. And I'm starting in my head hundreds of different things I could be thinking about. What am I going to talk about compassion? What's coming up with compassion? What should I narrow it down to? Because it's so huge. It's so big. So, and thank you guys for coming to my class yesterday. I, I truly enjoyed your presence there. So, of course, I have to start off with the meaning of compassion is to recognize the suffering of others and then take action to help. Compassion embodies a tangible expression of love for those who are suffering. Connecting with your heart, a heart to heart connection. And compassion can be as simple as handing someone a Kleenex when they're crying or saying hello to somebody, just making eye contact, offering to give someone a hug. It can be that easy and simple. Compassion, you may or may not know, and I know you know this, Mark, because I've heard you talk about this, is one of the eight limbs of yoga. And as a yoga instructor and someone that's practiced, I believe, at least eight years, um, probably been doing yoga for 10 years, I didn't really understand the ins and outs at all of it until I became an instructor and learned about the eight limbs. And one of the limbs is yamas, which means compassion for all living things, kindness, and a thoughtful consideration of other people and things. And if you um, get to be around yoga people, you will notice they have a certain aura about them um, because they get to where all these, uh, the lifestyles and how they choose to live their life um, as being a yogi, if you'd like to call it that. So um, I'm not saying I'm perfect by any way, shape or form in doing all the things that yoga people do with the eight limbs, but I definitely try uh, to live my life a certain way. Uh, and especially, being a police officer, I thought it was funny yesterday when we were talking in class and I asked the question, I told them, I said, so uh, what, because I said, I sit on a board and what do you think the number one response is from people that want to get hired as police officers? And they, there was some off the wall answer that I was just so surprised because I couldn't believe I didn't understand the number one reason people want to be a police officer. And, and I'm telling you, we, I was sat on that interview board many years and we've interviewed many, many people. And the number one answer, anybody here know it? And you can't say it because you, you heard it. I'm sorry? Thank you. Of course, you're a teacher, you would know that. Yeah, the number one answer, because we want to help people, because we want to be there for people. It's the number one answer. It's not anything else. That's why everybody goes what they do. So anyways, um, when you asked me to talk about compassion, I'm sitting there thinking about what do I want to talk about? And there's this one story that just kept coming back to me. No matter where I went, in the hundreds of things I could be talking about today, I kept coming back to this same story. And I thought, I guess I have to tell it. And you guys know, yeah, I, I told some stories yesterday. I'm a storyteller. When you're a police officer for 30 years, they like to hear the stories. They always hear the stories. But this is going to be a personal story, actually. So yesterday in our class, I had, in our suicide class, the second part of it, I told the story of how I was a survivor of a suicide at the age of nine from a family member that killed himself inside my house in Jamestown, New York, um, while we were all at home. The whole family was there. And I talked a little bit about it, but that incident alone began a complete spiral of my family, a complete spiral to where, and I said it changed my life forever. My family would never be the same after that day. Specifically, my mother. My mother started going into a very deep depression. Um, she developed mental illness. She developed, I guess you would, uh, 
pill problem, I guess. You know, I don't know. You, back then, they didn't even see it as that. But you'd open up my cabinet. I didn't even know what it was. You know, I was young. You open up the cabinet. My mom had a ton of prescription pills in there. She was always sick. There was always something going on. She was always just not right from that day. And in all honesty, you know, I always think of my life nine years old, my life before my mom at nine, my life after at nine. And um, we grew apart, just to say. We grew up, we were very different. Well, actually we were very alike because she was a writer, she was a deep thinker, but we did not get along. And the older I got, the stronger I got, and the more I recognized her mental illness and what it was doing to the family and the fact that she wouldn't get help. And it was just dreadfully painful, dreadfully for my entire family. Well, remember I lived in Oklahoma, but I'd come back every year. And I call this home, it's funny, because now that I'm here, I call Oklahoma home. But I came back here every year for 35 years. I was there for 35 years. I'd always come back in the fall time. And it was beautiful in the fall. I loved the fall, I loved the leaves changing. Come back here, two weeks. Do all sorts of things. Sometimes I'd come to Lilydale, I'd drive around, have a good time. Well, one year I came home, I was 39 years old. Routine time, coming home for the fall. And I was actually visiting my aunt in Northeast. And I got a phone call from my dad. And my dad's like, hey, your mom's in the hospital. And honestly, I'm just like, whatever. You know, like, psh, my mom's been in the hospital 100 times. Whatever, here we go again. And I really wasn't even concerned about it. I just didn't think twice about it. And um, I came back to Jamestown. And he's like, oh, he calls me again. Are you going to come to the hospital and see you? Yeah, I'm coming. I was getting my makeup, doing my hair. I mean, seriously, I was, I was that nonchalant. It just, I'm sorry to say, and I, I admit my whatever you want to call it, but it was just the truth of the matter. Um, so I end up getting ready. Uh, I was married at the time, and uh, we went to the hospital, and um, we're in the emergency room. Well, the cop and me, of course, I'm walking around because I'm a police officer at the time, and as I walk around the emergency room and I happen to go by, I didn't realize, and I look over and they're doing CPR on my mom. And I'm like, oh, crap. Uh, so I go around and my dad and my brothers and sisters are kind of sitting in this room and they don't really know what's going on. And I'm like, oh, this isn't good. Well, next thing we know, you know, the dreaded where they come and get the family and they're like, you need to go to this other room. You know, they put you in that other room. And I thought, oh, and I know what's going on. And I didn't tell my dad. I just saw him doing CPR on my mom. And um, so we all gather, and we go in the other room. And um, next thing I know, I guess my mom had suffered, believe it or not, a massive heart attack. She had a massive heart attack. It was a real deal this time. Um, they ended up transferring her to Hammett through the night. And we all went to Hammett the next day. By the time we got there, I never had, my mom went unconscious. We never had a chance to have a conversation again. Um, she was at Hammett, and um, they had her on life uh, source, and we were talking about what to do, and we made the decision to take her off life support. And we were trying to get my sister in from Germany. She was over in Germany and trying to get my brother and the whole family there. And, um, my sister never made it, but the rest of our family did get there, and um, we decided to, uh, let's say, take her off life support. So I'm still, in all honesty, not feeling a lot. I'm sorry. I just, I'd been through so much with my mother, just so much with my mother. Um, but when they took her off that life support, I decided to go over and grab her hand. And I held her hand, whatever it was, eight, ten minutes, until she stopped breathing, until her last and final breath. I would have to say that that is my way, that I was able to find a heart-to-heart -heart connection to show compassion to my mother, because I really wasn't able to show her that for many, many, many years, many years. But I wanted her to know in that time that I was there. And sometimes I think, did I do that out of guilt? Did I do that out of 
you know, I do that just to make myself feel better, to make it look good. But, and I thought about this and I said, I, I just kept going back to this story. When I thought about compassion, I just kept going back to the fact because it took a lot for me to go over and grab my mother's hand. And I think that's a clear sign of compassion. So, I may not be well read because I'm not, and I know many of you are. And I am not highly educated, I don't have a degree. But what I am is I'm extremely well versed in life itself and life events. Because I've seen more than most people will ever see in a lifetime. And what I can tell you is that compassion will mean nothing if you do it when it's easy. Compassion will mean everything in the world to you if you can show it towards someone you don't like, someone you don't even know if you love, someone maybe you hate. If you are able to go to that heart space and be compassionate to that person, then that, my friends, will be your greatest reward ever in the lesson of compassion. Namaste. Mm -hmm.